we are coming off a real exciting weekend uh, as a church. Last Sunday was just a great weekend or a great Sunday for us. We had uh, two two great things happen. We had our seniors, uh, one of our senior adult department. They got to have a tremendous fellowship, and there were around 45 to 50 of them all got to go have dinner together, which I thought was uh, was pretty a pretty good deal. But also, we had made a big push. Uh, we had Friend Sunday or Friend and Family Sunday. I made a big push to 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 get us in the habit of inviting and uh, between our two services we had almost 35 first time guests uh, last weekend which I just thought was tremendous and uh, but you know in, in, in reality that just needs to become a part of our lives um, part of our lives as individuals but part of our lives as a church as well they just as part of what we do we just are always kind of scanning the horizon of our life and saying okay who's out there who needs to connect or reconnect with the church or to connect or reconnect with the Lord, who do I already know that would would find our ministry here at Wynwood valuable to their life? And then just invite them to come along. Just say, hey, just come check us out. We'll go to church. We'll go to lunch. It'll be a non-threatening great thing. And and I just really believe that uh, that we would be surprised at the people who would be interested in visiting church. If they're simply asked, you know, I think a lot of times we, as church people, we're so in our routine that we we make the false assumption that, well, my friends know I go to church. If they wanted to come, they would come. Maybe not. In fact, rarely they they almost always need a nudge to come along, and that just needs to become part of who we are as individuals and as a church. So we're always ready to give that nudge to see more people. <coughs> excuse me, come in and benefit from what we have to offer as a church and, and ultimately from the relationship with the Lord that they can find through our ministries here. Uh, today, as, as we look towards today and over the next few weeks, we, we're starting a family series called Here in the Real World or Family uh, in the Real World. Uh, sometimes uh, we have a, ten, a tendency to, to create this picture-perfect idea of what family will look like. You know, maybe a, a engaged couple has this great thought at what marriage is going to look like and how they're going to take long walks every night and never fight and grocery shopping will be a dream. Okay. That's not always the real world of marriage. Sometimes when you get to parenting, you think it'll be so wonderful. They'll naturally learn how to to hit a ball and they'll sleep through the night because I'll do the schedule just like mommy wise or baby wise said and it'll all be perfect and it'll all go so smoothly it's not always parenting in the real world uh, there's hang ups uh, in our marriage there's hang ups in, in our parenting there's hang ups as we relate to our family as a whole to our, to our in-laws or, or to other people who, who want part of our time <coughs> excuse me and maybe bring some expectations so we're going to take a few weeks and we're going to talk about family in the real world. Uh, now as we do that, sometimes in church life, family series are kind of tricky because not every topic, not every week is going to directly apply to all of us. Um, today we talk about parent, uh, we talk about marriage, excuse me. Uh, not everyone in this room is married. We've got widows or widowers. We've got our, some of our young adults who are, <coughs> who are looking towards that time and they're they're trying to figure out, you know, who, who do I need to spend the rest of my life with? Uh, has God brought that person? Have they not? But they're trying to form concepts of marriage. So it won't directly hit everybody. Uh, parent, next week we have grandparenting. It's not going to hit a lot of us. But it's stuff as an overall church. It's going to hit pockets of us at all times. So if you show up today or, or next week or over the next few weeks, if it doesn't hit you, don't tune out. You know, don't open the bulletin and say, oh, it's, uh, this doesn't apply to me today. Stay tuned in. <coughs> Excuse me, because God still wants to speak to you. And he may speak about something on the topic that day. Maybe through that passage, he'll, he'll give you an idea that he, he wants to work on another idea, uh, area of your life. Or maybe he'll show you how you can still support and lift up this aspect of our church. You know, while you may not be married, you know, one thing in, in our first service where we've got more widows or widowers, I said you can still be an encourager to our married couples, and, and you can pass down the lessons you learned or are learning 
in your life. Uh, you know, in our first service, we have a couple named Chuck and Charlene Blackwell. And earlier this week, they celebrated their 59th year of marriage. And so we celebrated that with them as well. But I bring that up now just to say there's wisdom that even if, this, even if a topic doesn't hit you, there's still a way God may want you to plug in. So, so don't tune out throughout the family series because I know I've sat through them and, you know, as a single guy, I'm going, I don't need another sermon on marriage. Or, or as a parent, I don't, you know, before I had kids, I don't need a week on parenting. But there's still something that you can pick up on. Uh, today, like I said, we're going to talk about marriage. We're going to be at a, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, so you can go ahead and turn and we'll get there in just a minute. One thing I have found and continue to realize is we live in a world that loves our weddings. Our society loves weddings. There's TV shows about picking out a dress. Um, there's, there's weddings gone wonderful. There's reality shows to where you can peak to have your wedding paid for. Our society loves weddings. And weddings are a big deal cause in, in our world. Right now, my little brother's getting ready to get married in just a few weeks and and I, I called him the other day, and we're talking over some stuff. And I, I said, well, well, how are you? And he said, oh, I'm so stressed out. Okay, what's going on? He said, well, the wedding's coming up, and I'm trying to finish up and graduate from college. And I said, well, you just need to focus on school, because you're really not that important to the wedding at this phase of the whole deal. You just need to show up on time. And, and I'll be there, so I'll make sure you get to the church or, or wherever he's getting married at. I've not looked yet. I'll make sure you get there on time, and it'll all pan out. But our society, we love weddings. I, I looked up some, some statistics as I did my study time, and in a recent study put out by The Knot, which is a website, uh, some things they said is there are over 2 million marriages annually, 2 million weddings annually, with the average cost being over $31,000 per wedding. Manhattan, which is kind of a destination location, you know, you go to Manhattan to get married, that's the most expensive city to get married in. Your average wedding there is $76,000, well, $76,328 for a wedding. Dave Ramsey, a financial advisor I listen to, who usually does everything is, you know, on the cheap, you know, get as cheap as you can, he said in our culture today, the spending is so outrageous that he says you've at least got to keep wedding spending below half of the family's annual income. And to me, that just is insane. But we love weddings. And as much time in financial finances and energy that are poured into a couple hours, we at the same time live in a day to where our the actual marriages are challenged more than they've, maybe than they've ever been before. Which is so sad that we're investing so much in planning for a couple hours. Sometimes the planning takes us years or more. And yet we send them off to live happily ever after in a world that just is wreaking havoc on these long-term relationships. Some stats I read on, on the sustainability of marriages, one study I read said that despite the fact that we are actually seeing some positive trends in the divorce rate, a young couple getting married today, so take my little brother and his, his fiance Kristen, right now today they, they only stand a 60% chance of their marriage lasting a lifetime. Another study I read said that typically couples are the happiest in their third year of marriage, which I found kind of discouraging because if, if I want to aim for Chuck and Charlene at 59 years, that means it's all downhill from there. We, we've gotten jaded. <coughs> Often our, our culture's just gotten jaded about marriage. Barbara Bush, I read one of her quotes. She said, I simply married the first man I ever kissed. And we've just kind of adopted that as a pipe dream. Just a, a fairy tale that just doesn't really come true anymore. And today, as, as we look at marriage, as, as we think about marriage, uh, I took a passage that's, that's 
probably familiar if you've been around church for a while that discusses the what what each party is supposed to bring to the table, what the husband's supposed to do, what the wife's supposed to do. And I didn't break it down as a uh, you know as a slick. Here's ten steps to the marriage that that'll last a lifetime because it's not that simple. You know, is the marriage is the most complex relationship on earth. I really believe that. What I did is I want us to highlight how important marriage is to us, but also how important marriage is to the Lord. We've got to see how valuable it is. Uh, yesterday morning, I, I changed the oil in Gwen's van. You know, got, did it by hand in the driveway, got underneath there, did the work, cleaned up the mess. I didn't do that because I woke up on Saturday and say, I can't wait to lie down on the hot concrete so I can save five bucks doing the oil change at home. I did it because I paid a lot of money for that van, and I want to take good care of it because I recognize the value. Today, through this passage, I just want us to be reminded of how valuable marriages really are uh, because I believe if we recognize the value in our relationship, at the same time, we'll be challenged by both God and ourselves to take great care of it. When we recognize how important it is, we often take better care of it than when we take the value it brings for granted. So we're going to read, uh, we're going to take 10 verses in Ephesians. We're going to break down um, three main truths or three main facts about God's view of marriage and, and essentially what our view of marriage needs to be. And then at the end, we'll work through, I just wrote some practical things down that, that I, I believe they're, they're true. I believe they're biblically true and from God's point of view, they're true. They just didn't come specifically from today's text, but we'll work through those as well because I think there's some important reminders. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. And here it reads, Wives, submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He loves his wife, he loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body." Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pause for a quick word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for today, and we thank you for... Uh, we do thank you for the relationships you've given, uh, given us on earth. And uh, as we spend the next couple of weeks talking about them, God, I pray that you would uh, encourage us in the areas that we're doing well, uh, correct us in the areas to where we could do better, and just help us to be reminded of, of uh, the gifts you've given us with our families. And as we discuss all that, um, we, we would be uh, mindful of what you've given us and would take great care of it. God, as we look at marriages today, um, just uh, teach us all what, we need, what you would have us to learn based on where we are in life, um, and just uh, be with us over the next few minutes. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So again, as we look at this text today, we got 10 verses. I want us to pull three main facts or truths about marriage out of them, which will remind us all just how important God views our relationships. The first one I pulled from the first eight verses. There's just a lot of, seven, eight verses, a lot of, it's just a loaded couple, couple chunks of scripture. And the, the truth I want us to pull out is God uses marriage to meet our needs. 
One, one reason why our relationship with our husband, our relationship with our wife is so important is because it's where God intended for us to get some of our most important, crucial life needs met. Now, a couple years ago, Gwen and I took a real in-depth marriage course. Uh, took it, uh, our church offered it. Some of our friends were going through it. Uh, we'd kind of always been interested and just decided that was the right time in our life. So we went, and we went for seven, eight weeks, a couple hours every Sunday afternoon with about an hour's worth of reading and writing and, and homework we had to complete uh, each night. So it, it was truly a really in-depth course that hit on a lot of different topics that our, our marriages face. But we get in there and on the first week, <coughs> excuse me, on the first week, we get in and the instructor says, today we are going to start by talking about your emotional needs. I'm going, what is this? Three years ago, I didn't even believe emotional needs were a real thing. You just kind of wanted something from your spouse, and if you didn't get it, you just sucked it up and moved on and made it work. So we start talking about our emotional needs. And, and one thing that, that was a common theme in the course, and I've really seen it as true, is that we do all hold, as men, we hold a need to be respected and honored. And as women, they have a need to be loved and cared for. And God wants to use our marriages to meet those two needs. There are other places that we can get that need fed, but God wants to use our marriage. God designed us to need that. I really believe God knit men together with just a, a, a natural need to be respected and women with the natural need to be loved. So as Paul writes this, he stresses that men need to, uh, need to be respected from the wife, and he challenges women to honor their husbands and to show them how important he is by the words she says, the way she speaks about him when he's not around, and the way she treats him within the home, that he will get that need filled from his wife. Women, Paul stresses, they have a need to be loved. Now, Paul uses some, some terms I want us to catch, because if you take back to the Greek, two main words he uses, they've got some, some particularly, they, they just speak really loud to us, but he uses the term nourishes and cherishes. Now, the other time that Paul uses those words are, are in conversations and writing when he's actually discussing how you would care for a new child. Now, now, many of us, we've held a newborn, and we know how gentle you are. You know, maybe as a new father, you remember thinking, I don't want to break this little thing. So you're just very tender and gentle. Many of us have roughed house with a toddler or with an older child, and they get bigger, and you can, you can get down on the floor and scuffle a bit. Most of us are wise enough not to interchange those two activities with the wrong age group. You don't wrestle with a newborn, right? Paul challenges husbands you nourish and you cher care for. You're very tender and affectionate and loving with your wife. Now, some men can do that very naturally. Some men are more stoic. Either way, we're not off the hook. Same goes for women. I've heard women say, well, I could respect my husband more if, if he was as honorable as this guy over here. And I heard a pastor who he heard that from a wife, and his wife said, well, maybe if you would respect him as much as you should and show him that, maybe he'd suddenly become more honorable in your eyes. See, these are things we naturally have to do in our relationship, and it's part of why God designed marriage. We can get these needs met somewhere else. Men can, can get respected at work. But if they feel highly honored and valued and respected at work, and that's not present in the home, they're going to take a step towards work where they receive that. And it will eventually create a distance at home. And I've seen women do a similar pattern. They need to feel loved and cherished and nurtured. And if they're not getting that from their husband, they'll find another resource for that. It may be by... Uh, over-investing in relationships with friends, and that's where they draw their love, or, or with their, their parents. 
Now, not that having friends or being close with your folks is a bad thing. It just gets backwards if someone else is the resource where you pull all the love that you need. And if that's where you receive it instead of from your husband, again, it's going to create a distance there. One of the reasons God, marriage is so important to God is because he designed it for be, to be a place where our needs are met. And Paul does a fantastic job of just stressing how important the, the makeup that God gave us is and the fact that as spouses, we need to look to our mate to receive that. We also have to make sure that we're giving what they need in return so that we're stepping towards each other instead of away from each other to get that natural itch scratched. Second reason, or second need that God wants to use marriage to meet is that of spiritual growth. Um, I believe that, uh, that, that a healthy marriage is God's primary way, one of his primary vehicles to grow the kingdom. Uh, one of my overarching church philosophies is that God gave us a great commission to go and build his kingdom and to make disciples. And I believe he gave us two primary vehicles to do that, or two primary ways. I think he gave us the church and the family. And the health of the family hinges on the health of the marriage. The spiritual growth of the family hinges upon the spiritual growth that's, that is or is not taking place in the marriage. And Paul draws out that Part of the marriage that honors the Lord and when it's functioning like God designed, both parties in that relationship are growing spiritually as a couple, but also just as individuals. And we can facilitate that by our encouragement, by prioritizing the other person's time with the Lord that they spend on a one-on-one -on -one basis, by prioritizing our schedule so that if they need to be a part of a Bible study or some other outlet for spiritual growth that that we take things off their plate so they can go do that, or we cover scheduling needs so they've got that time. But spiritual growth is part of the, the way God designed marriage. When the couple grows together well, the children will grow well. And then you can really begin to see an aggressive and exciting trickle-down effect that can last over generations. But I believe that God uses marriage as one of the primary ways he builds his kingdom. A third thing I pulled from this passage, uh, from the first seven or eight verses, and it's not necessarily a need, it's just associated with the other scriptures, is one reason that marriage is so important to God is it represents how he relates to the church. That, that it represents the sacrifice and the love that he gave to us when he sent his son to die on the cross. And the wife's response should mimic our response to the Lord. See, I think, I th I think the same cycle can happen in, in both areas, the, the way the church and the, and the marriage, that when, when we recognize that Christ gave himself up and you know, gave his life so we could have a relationship with him, we respond with respect and honor. And when we respect and honor him, we're given even more reality of, and we experience even more how much he loves us. I, I think that is how our marriages ought to function as well. Because I believe that when a, when a wife really feels loved and valued by her husband, she will respond by giving him the respect and honor he needs. And when he gets that, he'll respond with the love that she wants. He'll get, the, he'll get the respect he wants from her. Now again, our personalities can either really lend us to being naturally affectionate um, or, or naturally good at expressing honor or value. Others of us, we may have to work a little bit harder at sharing how we feel, showing how valuable someone is, or, or a, a wife simply expressing the, the respect she has. Whether it's natural or not, you're not off the hook. It's stuff we've got to do, whether this is second nature or doing it feels so uncomfortable, it, it's work when we first start doing it. But part of why marriage is so important to God is it mimics or it mirrors to the world his love for them. 
So much so that I believe that, a, that someone who doesn't have a relationship with the Lord ought to be able to look at a healthy, spiritual, a healthy Christian marriage and say, I want that. I, I want the love and the respect that takes place there. But then be drawn to, to a relationship with Christ. That, that, that their attention would go that way, not just to try to find it in a relationship with another human being. So one of the reasons why, one of the facts about marriage is, it, uh, is that God uses it to meet our needs. A second fact about marriage is that it stood the test of time. Verse 31 says, uh, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, as part of our scripture, part of our service, we, re- we read a scripture passage in Genesis that sounded an awful lot like that. Well, it sounded like it because Paul's quoting what Moses wrote in Genesis about Adam and Eve and how the two were going to become one unit and function together. Marriage has stood the test of time. Marriage is still used by God as a way he builds disciples in a way he just simply brings love and blessings into our life. Stood the test of time between the gap between when Moses wrote about Adam and Eve and when Paul wrote Ephesians. And it's continued to stand the test of time as something God wants to use from when Paul wrote Ephesians into today. Now, we live in a world to where everything's changing. In fact, a lot of things seem to be changing incredibly quickly. I, I took my kids into Subway the other day, and as I did that, I remembered as a child when I went into Subway and you had like two choices of bread and one type of cheese and like four types of meat. And that was it. Now you go into Subway and you got like seven types of bread, 40 combinations of meat and cheese, and you can spend, <coughs> you can spend a half hour reading the menu. Things are changing. Some of you will remember when you had to do a repair job at home on a car or at the house. If you found a broken part, you had to drive across town to a store where where a guy behind the counter would figure out what parts you needed. He would pull out a book, a magazine, look it up, and either have to order it or he'd go to the back of the shop and pull it out. Recently, I had to replace a part on our washing machine. I plugged the part number into Amazon and it was at my doorstep in two days. Things are changing. And in some ways, even God has adjusted things over time. The way we did church or the way that God worked in churches 30 years ago, well, he's using something new now. But marriage has stood the test of time as something God wanted to use. And I don't believe he'll be replacing it as a primary way to build his kingdom anytime soon. It's something that God has and will always use to grow us spiritually, to take care of us in just a physical and an emotional way. It's something that will always be around. Marriage is incredibly important to God. It's not just something he gave some rules about or some overarching principle through his word. I think God takes our relationship with our spouse incredibly personally, and we need to reflect the value we see in it and that God places on it with our own viewpoint and with how we interact with our spouse and conduct our marriages as well. But marriage has stood the test of time. When everything else changes, marriage will still be there as something God wants to use in our lives and in his kingdom. The third fact about marriage I want us to pick up on is it it represents Christ's love for us. Now let's read verses 32 through 33 real quick. And here it's written, This mystery is profound. I am, I am not saying that it refers to Christ and the church. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, now I touched on this a moment ago, but, but we circle back because Paul drives the fact home that a, a, a marriage that is functioning well, that is representing the Lord well, 
It represents Christ's love for us. We see it very circular that Christ would do anything to connect with us. In fact, he did everything he could to have a relationship with us. And because of that, we need to give him the honor and respect that he deserves. And we can see that cycle play out, and it goes over and over. It's a real exciting growth process in our lives. A marriage ought to be the same way. That a, and in fact, if it works well, it is the same way. That the husband loves and takes care of the wife and provides what she needs from him. And she respects him and honors him. And she expresses that in a way he receives it. And that represents Christ's love for the church. It represents his value for the church. It represents his love and value for us as individuals. And I think God, when, when he looked at how, how things were going to function on earth, I think he said, I want there to be a way to where people can visibly see what a relationship with me can be like. I want for people to be able to look at something and say, that looks like what Christ's love looks like. So he, made, so he uses our marriages to do that. That the way we love and interact and care for and respect and honor the way all these things take place, the world can look at that in a, in a well-functioning Christian marriage and say that must be what it's like as Christ loves me and takes care of my needs as well. So we see as Paul writes, marriage is important. It's important to God and it's important needs to be important to us as well. But I think there's some practical things that, that I want us to look at real quick. And I've got, uh, I've got five things real quick that, again, like I said up front, I, I believe these are true as the text we just read because I think they're derived from, spiritual, from bi other biblical principles. Um, and I think these are important that we remember along the way. Um, first is marriage is God's gift to us. I think God gave us marriages so that we do have someone that we can count on, that someone that loves us, someone that, that scratches the natural itch we have that we bring to the table in our relationship. But marriage is God's gift to us. One of the ways we show God our appreciation for that is by taking good care of it. If you've given a kid a toy and found it in the yard the next day, you know how frustrating that is. To watch someone just not take care of something you've given them. Sometimes we care for our marriages in such a way that it probably frustrates God a little bit. We need to change that. Marriage is God's gift to us. Second, just practical reality, is that the enemy doesn't want your marriage to succeed. No. Marriages are important to God. And because of that, our Satan, our spiritual opponent, he's going to do whatever he can to frustrate and disrupt our marriages. So sometimes if you find yourself in conflict with your spouse, you just need to take a time out and say, okay, is, is, this, is this a real issue or is this something that our enemies made up? So you know who to fight against. So that you can direct it and say, you know what, this is, the enemy's just trying to mess us up because he knows what all God can do through our marriage. So we're not going to let him do that. We won't make a big deal about this issue or we're going to calm down and we'll make a decision in a much more healthy and productive way. But the enemy doesn't want your marriage to succeed. Third, it takes more than you would have expected. It takes more of everything than we would have initially expected. And I think that's true with each changing season of life. Uh, when, you, when you're newlyweds, it probably takes more time than you expected. Uh, you know, my dad said it always costs more than you expect. It always takes more time than you expect. And I think most of us that have been married say that's true. Um, it takes more effort than you expect. And I think when you add kids, when you add growing careers, when you add caring for aging parents, when you add caring for an aging spouse, it always requires a little more of us than maybe we naturally thought it would when we set out. It just means it's time to step up our game a little bit and make sure we still put our best forward within that relationship, no matter what that new season of life requires of us. Fourth practical reality, it's, uh, 
it's this, it's that divorce is never God's best, but there's always forgiveness and grace. Um, earthly relationships don't always go as we would have planned or as God would have planned. That's just a reality. But if you found yourself there, it doesn't mean that God's given up on you or that you've been rendered ineffective because of that decision you made. There's always forgiveness, and God will always continue to use you and work through you, no matter what happened in your life. So don't let that determine, or don't let that event in your life determine your future effectiveness in God's kingdom. Because he still has a plan, and there's always forgiveness. Last just highly practical thing is get the help you need. Uh, you know, when I do premarital counseling, I, I have the couple come in and they're always just smiling. They're just so excited to be at premarital counseling. Because everything's fun when you're engaged. It's like doing the dishes is fun when you're an engaged couple. The night after the wedding, it's just doing dishes all of a sudden. Uh, but they come into premarital counseling. They're just so in love and everything's going to be so perfect. And I sit across from them and the first thing I say is your marriage is going to struggle at some point. And you need to get the help you need. One reality is, is, is that I've sat here as a counselor, or as a pastoral counselor, and I've seen couples come in, and they'll say, you know, we finally decided it was time to get the help we need. But sometimes by the time couples reach out to their pastor, or to a professional counselor, or sometimes even to their friends... I'll never say it's too late. Sometimes they come into where it takes an all-out miracle to put that relationship back together so it can function and those two can move forward. Um, things get out of hand fairly quickly in marriages. So when you start to see, yeah, something's not quite right here, we're, we're fighting extra, we're distant, just, just step out and get the help you need. That, the, and that does not have to be highly formal sometimes the relational help I've gotten is by calling a friend who I know will be very blunt with me and say just get over yourself or yeah you may have a point but what's the point in being right sometimes a phone call with a friend can really help our marriage sometimes you do need to come in and you can come down and sit with me um, some couples at will time at certain times We'll need some more in-depth help with a professional, someone who really understands how to walk a, a marriage healing process through. No matter what help you need, you need to get it. There's no shame in that at all. It's actually pretty respectful in my mind that at the earliest sign of something that could be a problem when a couple says, no, we're going to address this. And if that means speaking about it to someone, that's okay. But don't let things get out of hand in your relationship with your spouse. Because it happens too quickly, and the damage gets to be pretty severe before we even recognize what's broken. So again, those are just some real practical things. I, I, believe, I believe all truth is God's truth. So it's not like I just made those up. I think these are rooted in, in uh, biblical principles. And then we've got our texts that outline why marriage is so valuable. It's valuable because it represents Christ's love for us. It's important because it stood the test of time and we know God's going to want to continue to use marriage as a whole, but also our individual relationships. It's important because it's how we get our needs met. You know, every week we, um, we have our time of response. And in my mind, this is just a time we all need to press pause. And uh, we just need to make sure that before we leave and we start another busy week, or another routine, that if God's trying to challenge our minds with something, or if there's something we need to take care of, either spiritually or with another person, we, we get that put into motion. And so, uh, just like every week, Pastor Don's going to come up. Uh, he and our team will lead us in a, a, a song of worship. And if you're here and, and you need to visit with someone, I'm always available. But if you're here and you just need to think on something, you can just do that right where you're at. Uh, but I'm going to pray, and then we're, uh, Pastor Don will lead us in our time of response. Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for um, all you have to teach us and all you want to accomplish through us. 
I just ask that you be with us over the next few moments that, uh, God, if there's anything on our minds or anything you're trying to challenge our hearts with, that before we start a, a new week, that we would take care of that either right now in the next few minutes or we would take care of that today before it, it slips off our mind or, or gets buried in a pile of other things we've got to do this week. God, I do thank you for marriage and the way that it's uh, impacting so many lives. God, and I thank you that you did set something up that, that takes care of us, that helps, uh, helps us grow spiritually. And you gave us a model that we know is going to be around and, and that you will continue to use in our individual lives and just in the, the course of time. So thank you for today. Just help us to be obedient in our, our minds over the next few minutes. And just be with us as we close out our service. It's in your name we pray. Amen.